Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video R, we're going to continue our discussion of the hemoglobin dissociation curve, or you could call it the hemoglobin um, saturation curve, but we're going to focus on various factors that can impact the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. So what impacts oxygen loading and unloading. There are four factors that impact hemoglobin saturation. Temperature, pH, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and then a byproduct of glycolysis in our red blood cells called BPG, which stands for 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. We'll just refer to it as BPG. Each one of these four factors is going to increase in metabolically active cells. Cells that are metabolically active are going to see a rise in temperature. They're going to see an accumulation of hydrogen ions, which lowers their pH. They're going to accumulate more carbon dioxide, and they're going to see an increase in BPG because the red blood cells um, are going to also become metabolically active in the blood that is nearby them. So we see increases in any of these factors in met metabolically active cells. And any of these four factors, when they increase, are going to change the 3D structure, the three-dimensional structure of our complex protein called hemoglobin. And any time a protein changes this 3D structure, it's also going to be more difficult for oxygen to stay bound. And therefore, we see that a change in the 3D structure of hemoglobin due to the increase of any of these factors is going to promote oxygen unloading. While a decrease in any of these factors is, of course, going to promote oxygen loading. When we talk about oxygen unloading, we're typically referring to something called the Bohr effect. So when hydrogen levels increase in metabolically active cells, or the partial pressure for carbon dioxide increases in metabolically active cells, it's going to weaken the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen because the three-dimensional structure changes and we see oxygen unloading. We could even add temperature here because if the temperature increases, again, we're, we'll see a change in the 3D structure that promotes unloading of oxygen. There's also an indirect effect of the temperature because if the temperature rises in tissues, then the red blood cells in the capillaries nearby are going to also start metabolizing faster, and therefore they're going to produce much more BPG, which is one of the byproducts of glycolysis. These molecules of BPG like to bind with hemoglobin, and when they do, they're again going to promote oxygen unloading. By the way, when temperatures drop, everything reverses and BPG uh, stops binding to hemoglobin such that oxygen can bind again to hemoglobin. So all of this oxygen unloading we just discussed, whether it's in relation to temperature or hydrogen levels or, or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, is referred to as the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect always relates to oxygen. We'll later on talk about another effect called the Haldane effect, and that relates to carbon dioxide. So we've looked at these four factors that can impact the saturation levels for hemoglobin. Remember what they are again? Temperature, hydrogen levels, which therefore re reflects pH levels, partial pressure for carbon dioxide, and BPG. If we see an increase in any of those, 
we see that more oxygen unloading occurs. So let's start with that. If we see an increase in either hydrogen ions or an increase in temperature, we're going to produce these two graphs. First off, when we're looking at a normal pH for our blood, we have a pH level of a little bit over 7, right? 7.4 is the normal pH for our blood. Remember that pH is actually inverse re related to um, the number of hydrogen ions. So if we say that our hydrogen ion, ion levels are increasing due to the fact that our active, metabolically active uh, tissue cells are producing more and more lactic acids, by the way, remember that translates into a lower pH. So be careful with interpreting our information here. Okay, so if this is the normal graph at a normal pH, notice that when our hydrogen levels begin to increase, therefore decrease in pH, our graph shifts to the right. What does that mean? Well, we learned in the earlier slide that oxygen unloading should occur because when we have all of these acids accumulating in our tissues, it means they're metabolically active and they're needing oxygen and the acidity is literally changing the 3D structure of hemoglobin, promoting the unloading of oxygen. Is this happening when we're shifting to the right in our curve? Well, again, I like to look at this curve from the perspective of oxygen unloading, and remember that's in this direction. So if we look in this direction, which is oxygen unloading, oops, can't spell anymore, it's getting very late at night here, um, then if we follow for our normal curve, notice how we have a plateau here, so not much oxygen unloading occurring here, and then, yes, we start to see a steeper portion. But take a look at this graph. We have a pretty steep curve here almost right away. And this implies that oxygen loading, I'm sorry, unloading is occurring much faster compared to our normal curve. And so the opposite is the case for when pH of the blood rises. Then we're going to hold on to our oxygen much longer before it starts to unload. So when the pH is higher or our hydrogen levels are lower, it implies our tissues are metabolically inactive, so no need to be unloading, and it's not going to happen because the 3D shape of hemoglobin is not changing. Now you can interpret the second graph the same way. So our normal body temperature is around 37. Here they have it set at 38 for our normal graph. If we now increase the temperature, because tissues are metabolically active, perhaps we even have a fever, we're going to see, we should be seeing an increase in oxygen unloading. So again, go in this direction because that implies we're going from the lungs to the tissues, so therefore we're unloading the oxygen. Notice that once again we have a steeper slope here when the temperature is high compared to our normal temperature. And when the temperature really starts to drop, we have, and we should really extend these graphs here, we have pretty much a plateau here and a plateau there, like so, and therefore we have next to no unloading occurring for a long time until we get to this point here. 
So, in short, when oxygen unloading occurs due to an increase in any of our four factors, so you could create new graphs that represent levels of BPG or that represent increases in partial pressure of carbon dioxide. All of them should show then that the curve will shift to the right when they increase and therefore we need to see more oxygen unloading. If there is a decrease in any of the factors, and again we just have two of them lifted, listed here, then our curve is going to shift to the left. It probably is not the best idea for you to memorize when the curve shifts to the right or the left. Be sure that you can interpret the curves such that you understand that oxygen unloading at 37, 38 degrees Celsius between the lungs and the t from the lungs going to the tissues occurs slower than when we look at what happens at a higher body temperature. And just a quick reminder, we've looked at this before, and that is carbon monoxide poisoning. Remember that the spot for oxygen on the heme groups can be taken up by carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide has a much, much, much higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen does. So if carbon monoxide is in the same area or in the same atmosphere, spheric air mixture that you're inhaling as oxygen is, it will compete with carbon with with oxygen and take the spot of oxygen to where we're starting to suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning and of course that's going to lead to a form of hypoxia